Hello everyone and, and welcome to this session on uh, design and economic growth. My name is Matt Hunter, I'm Chief Design Officer at the Design Council um, and I'm hosting this session. We've assembled a fabulous panel um, and more about them in just a moment, but before I introduce them I ought to introduce the topic that we'll be discussing. So the topic is, how is the design industry helping the economy recover? Now that's a big high level uh, question which we'll be trying to make much more tangible for everyone here. But one of the things we work hard at at the Design Council is ensuring that businesses of all forms use design at the heart of their business. The simple fact is that the great design talent that we have and that we can see so evident around this place is not always uh, employed as much as it should in various companies. So design is not consistently used as a tool for business and therefore economic growth. So the issue is that design is quite complex, occasionally mysterious. Um, you know, at the best of times, we can struggle to understand its economic value. But these are not the best of times. And so therefore, the justification for design investment uh, can often be that much harder. So the difficulty is that design is not naturally, um, I think, economically literate. It doesn't argue. Uh, in terms of ROI very easily. It's much more emotional than that. I mean, who amongst us did not have a swell of pride as David Beckham uh, zoomed down the Thames for the Olympic opening ceremony in an amazing boat with Barbara Osgoby's fantastic torch up the front end, running into a glorious stadium, just one of many wonderful buildings within the Olympic Park, uh, ultimately to light Thomas Heatherwick's cauldron uh, that was absolutely wonderful and poetic. And yet, when we think about design's contribution to the Olympics, we think, great, but how does that translate into business? As designers, we look at that and we say, what a fantastic experience. Surely this will help every business person understand um, that products and services that give greater experience and better joy um, will uh, lead to economic success. Well, actually, no. We have to translate things a little bit more. So that link between design and economic growth the link that so often business people need to see in order to justify the investment uh, and policymakers need in order to know how best to design to support design and creativity um, we need more clarity so just this week in terms of what we're doing at the design council we published some figures some information that we're going to be sending to small and medium enterprises around the country so for instance we say here the difference is design in a survey of uh, about 250 enterprises that we've worked with recently, one pound invested led to uh, four pounds 12 net operating profit, more than 20 pounds of turnover, five pounds 27 of net exports, and 26 pounds or more in terms of social return on investment. Now is that enough? Is all we need these sort of simple metrics uh, that we can add to all the wonderful experiences here and suddenly uh, business skeptics will be bowled over and start investing in design. Maybe, maybe not. So we've assembled a panel that can hopefully enrich this debate and begin to shed a little bit more light onto it. Let me uh, introduce the panel first. I'm delighted to introduce on my far left um, Ed Vasey, Minister for Culture, Communications and the Creative Industry, who very recently um, added heritage and architecture to his portfolio. Then, uh, next to him, Nick Bolton, Chief Executive OMG, an imaging technology group headquartered in Oxford with 250 uh, employees uh, in the UK, the US, and the Far East. Next to him, we have Clive Grinier, the Director of Customer Experience for Cisco's IBSG group, um, which creates innovation for uh, the various clients that Cisco has. And finally, we have Medea Cohen Petrolino, who's the creative director of the School for Creative Startups that she runs with Doug Richard, uh, the ex Dragon's Den Dragon, helping uh, young creatives to set up their own businesses. So I hope you see we've got a pretty good range of experience here from uh, the sort of national and international perspective, business, public, uh, and um, startups. So what we're gonna do is start with um, some short provocations from each person and then we'll have some time for panel debate and ultimately questions from the floor. So, uh, Minister, would you like to kick us off with any thoughts you've got about how you see creativity and growth? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think I should come last uh, because obviously government ministers don't like to be provocative. We like to soothe and calm. Uh, but it's very nice to be here. I accepted this uh, invitation long before I became the Minister for Design, which I became uh, the Minister of Design, I think, last week. 
uh, and uh, I'm now responsible for the Design Council or Design Council CABE as it's known, but in opposition, when I did have the design brief, I was a passionate supporter of the importance of design. And one of the things I think I'm proud of achieving is that uh, our national planning policy framework is a very small document. We've significantly reduced uh, the amount of planning regulations. Uh, but within that 50 page document, I think three pages are devoted to the importance of good uh, design. So that was advocacy within government to talk about why design makes a difference. Uh, and design is absolutely crucial. How do you get that across to businesses and so on? And it's crucial not just in uh, the showcase designs that we see in an exhibition uh, like this, but it's crucial, I think, in every aspect of our lives in making people's experiences better. Just to illustrate my passion for design, I got run over by a car on the 23rd of April, a badly designed car, an old Skoda, uh, and the thing I thought most about as I was being taken to hospital was how badly designed a lot of the products were. So in theory, I could have had a broken back, uh, but the hospital transfer system works in the, where you're moved onto three different stretches to have your MRI scan, your X-ray, and to be examined in the hospital bed. So that kind of good design can make a difference. How can government make a difference to good design, first of all through procurement. And one of the things that we, I think, want to do and hopefully will do is to make it much easier for government to purchase off small businesses. Uh, it's very hard for a small business to get a contract with government. Government finds it much easier to deal with large scale businesses, but we aren't trying to make uh, changes there. Other things we can do, and I suspect some of the other panel members will also have views on this, uh, is to look at access to finance. It's incredibly difficult for small creative businesses to access finance. It's much easier for finances to understand the business model of a pizza takeaway restaurant uh, than it is to understand an innovative design company and what it's uh, capable of. So I think those are two very important things. The third point that occurred to me when Matt was making his introduction is you can't, government can't mandate how to run businesses. It can't possibly run businesses up and down the country. You can't make a business embrace design. Great businesses that have design at their heart and succeed do so because the people within that business are passionate and they understand it through their life experience, through their education or whatever. Of course, we can do things in the school curriculum to promote design. But I think one thing perhaps that in my new role I could work with Design Council CABE, uh, and it's partly through my own experience as a constituency MP, is to identify small local businesses where design has made a real difference. Because I think business, business people learn from their peers. And people are much, small businesses in particular, uh, businesses that could grow through the use of good design, will probably take design more seriously if they see their peer group, another local business of a similar size and scale that is using design uh, to get a competitive edge. So that uh, is my one action point that I've taken already, having already been provoked by Matt. Thanks very much. Thanks very much indeed. Um, so Nick, your perspective of design in your business. Okay, <coughs> thanks uh, Matt. Um, so just a quick introduction to, uh, to our business. So we're, um, we're called Oxford Metrics Group. We're a group of uh, technology companies which broadly speaking uh, design uh, manufacture and market uh, a variety of cameras and related software uh, to a variety of different uh, industries. So that means uh, one of our companies makes motion capture cameras uh, for the video games uh, industry and also for analyzing uh, biomechanics. We've got another company that makes surveying vehicles and software that's used in the highways industry. And lastly, we have a consumer electronics business that's working on a new uh, innovative uh, camera. Um, so what's our involvement with the design industry? Well, we use uh, services from people like, uh, I guess, you in the audience, from external industrial design houses and from graphic design houses. We also undertake some design inside our business in terms of electronics design, software design, hardware design. So, uh, so that's us. And that's, I guess, the context for why I think uh, design is useful to us and our business and uh, more broadly for economic growth. Um, in fact, in this session, I understand I have five minutes. Um, I'm not going to cover the fundamental uh, economic benefit of design. I think that's well understood. 
okay? And to be honest, if you, anybody in the audience doesn't think that's true, I guess you're at the wrong show because it is called 100% design. Rather, I'm going to focus on how we can get design to drive uh, even greater economic benefit in the UK by making a few changes because right now I think we're missing a few tricks. And those tricks really relate to the link between design uh, and manufacturing. And I know this is, this is common territory, but I think it's relevant. There can be no doubt that the UK industrial and graphic design uh, sector is world renowned, right? You only have to look at the number of pieces of Italian furniture that have got British names uh, against them. But despite this global excellence in design, uh, British product companies don't derive enough economic benefit from this fantastic local design uh, capability. So what's going wrong? Well, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know all the answers, but I'll, I'll give you a few of my observations, yeah? I've got four points I want to make. My first one is that I, I feel we don't have enough, enough design for manufacturing skills available, okay? That you can find great design skills in this country, you can find good mechanical engineering skills, and you can find people to run production lines, but you also need people who can make sure the designs themselves can really be made at the right quality uh, and at the right cost. And for me, that's the role of design for manufacturing, or DFM. So to fix this, I'd suggest that we need to increase the DFM element in both mechanical engineering qualifications and in design courses. We generate way too many engineers uh, in this country who understand useless things like thermodynamics. I know that because I studied thermodynamics for three years, and I can attest it is genuinely useless. We need engineers who can actually make things, right? So we need more designers on the, on the flip side who can understand the processes which make their designs uh, possible, right? It's not just about the render, it's about the object itself. So let's educate for more design for manufacturing. That's my first point. Second point is I don't think we've got enough understanding in the design world of the potential manufacturing techniques and the suppliers of those capabilities. To fix this, I'd encourage designers to get out there, spend time in manufacturing plants, understanding what is and what isn't possible, and then building a roster uh, of those manufacturers. It's not enough for designers to just know about design and then leave it to the client to source manufacturing. That's a design responsibility as much as a manufacturing responsibility. My third point is that I think we've got an absence of broadly held aesthetic understanding in our society. Well, that's a big, big statement. And it's certainly true in our manufacturing. I've been to way too many meetings where the manufacturers rolled their eyes at the designer's unwillingness to add a taper to a surface or, or just correct a radius, yeah? And they're rolling their eyes because fundamentally they don't understand the aesthetic impact of those changes. That's because essentially they can't read the design aesthetically, yeah? That's a fundamental failure. How do we fix that? Well, we educate for aesthetics at school. It's as straightforward as that. People have an inability to describe why they think a design is or isn't working. Uh, one of the classic phrases that come up is, um, uh, you do it and I'll know it when I see it. Well, that's completely unhelpful as design feedback. You have to give relevant uh, and accurate aesthetic related feedback. We have to improve the education of aesthetics. My last point is that um, there are simply some manufacturing techniques we don't have in the UK anymore that are only available in the Far East. Um, we can make two specific changes here. Make it easy for manufacturers to invest in capital equipment, and I think government's got a role to play there. And secondly, to get UK manufacturers to collaborate and share their understanding with manufacturers in the Far East. And I think, again, government uh, has got a role to play there. So those are my four points with some suggested remedies. I believe if we can do a better job of integrating design and manufacturing, we'll see a real amplification uh, of design's contribution to economic prosperity. And that's got to be good for this audience, the design community, and the UK as a whole. So, thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Nick. And hopefully we'll pick up some of those points and develop them later on. So, Clive, over to you. Well, that's a great um, introduction there. Thank you. Because I violently disagreed with about half of what you said and violently agreed with the other half. Um, but I, I do think you've absolutely accurately summed up the reasons why um, my old mate and chum who I met again last night at the DNA Design Awards, Jonathan Ive, is no longer working in the UK. Um, he and I, some of you may know, ran a design agency. And last night, if you're looking for metrics and, and uh, proof of ROI on design, 
there was Jonathan Ive, Sir Jonathan Ive, and his uh, 17 of his design team on stage at, in uh, the 50-year Design and Art Director's uh, Jamboree, big party, 1,500 people celebrating it. The most successful brand in any design competition in that design competition over 50 years. Uh, and at the same time, the world's most successful business. You know, have we not sorted that now? Can we move on, please? Design is a good thing. We don't need to have any more uh, return on investment metrics. There's the living proof, you'd have thought. Uh, but we know it's not absolutely straightforward as that. Um, but I'm taking a completely different angle because I work for Cisco, a big technology company. Uh, in, in many ways, I'd rather we didn't make things anymore, but um, we provided wonderful services and, and had everything virtual. I think in many ways, uh, having a super fast broadband is a hell of a lot better than building a railway line. We can have a separate conversation about that. Um, <coughs> but <laughs> um, but uh, the thing about technology, and if we're looking at, at regenerating the economy, I suspect an awful lot more people would agree that technology might regenerate our economy than design, ironically. And they may have a point, and Cisco may well argue that, because we can see that technology, uh, for example, with our retail customers, you know, creates completely new experiences, reaches new customers, allows existing customers to, to reconnect with the big department store brands, for example. We can see um, that you know, efficiency and reach in terms of the cloud allows any business to have exactly how much computing power they want when they want it, fantastically efficiently and cheaper. We can see that public sector services can be scaled much better when you have technology giving healthcare, looking after our aging population in more innovative ways. Uh, we can empower citizen innovation, I've got a long list here, uh, public services, democracy and enterprise. We can help people be more, more entrepreneurial through, through technology, um, which sounds fantastic, doesn't it? So why do we need design? Well, the fact is that a lot of this technology, as we also know, very often doesn't work and is very expensive and is chaotic in its development cycle. And this is, I think, where design plays an absolutely critical role in how we develop technologies. Um, now, technology world mirrors the sort of manufacturing engineering world that you, that you described, which is often very brilliant, but um, historically pretty uncustomer centric thought processes, um, you know, that didn't give us cars that people actually wanted. They might have been easy to make. Um, it also gave us, you know, our own champion of computers for the people, um, as in Amstrad and Alan Sugar, at the same time that Steve Jobs had exactly the same idea with somewhat different outcomes. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's the problem we've had. And technology is, is full of a similar mindset, if I'm honest. Um, however, in our academic centres, in our science parks, whether they be in Cambridge or Birmingham, on the little startups, whether they be in Shoreditch or whether they be in Glasgow, there is a breed of successful companies, very often with designers actually at their very core, as the entrepreneurs who start them, in, often in collaboration with, with uh, techies, let's just call them that. Um, these, people, these are the people who are creating the successful new startups, where they're bringing their understanding of their value, they understand why their technology solutions and their service solutions will have impact. And Cisco, in fact, run an innovation award, the British Innovation Gateway. We give money and we are cu currently going through the judging of that. And we are seeing absolutely the best startups are those that have young designers and young techie capability actually collaborating. In Shoreditch, they sit next to each other in the same Dickensian workhouses and, and old factories because it's nice cheap rent, whether you're a startup or a, or a branding agency. Um, but are they living together enough? Are they, are they sleeping enough together? That's what we need to do. We need to get design and technology together to really regenerate the economy. So I think design is, is vital to that. Uh, when I was at the Design Council and we set up the Designing Demand Programme, that is still going now, I'm glad to say, when, we, when companies took part in that, they were shocked at how impactful design was right across their business. I think we need to carry on doing that with all sorts of companies, whether they're manufacturing or technology. So they really get to use what I think is our actually probably most prevalent and most important national resource, natural resource right now, which is our fantastic design asset. Thanks a lot. I'm sure that's over five minutes, but thank you. <laughs> but it was gripping <laughs> stuff. Thank you very much, Clive. And last but not least, Medea. Hi, I'm representing for the ladies in design. Um, my name is Medea. I run something called School for Creative Startups, um, which teaches uh, creative people how to build businesses from what they make and do. Um, a lot of those people are designers. Um, and I spend a year minimum 
coaching them, working with them, putting them through their paces. Um, as Matt mentioned, with Doug Richard, who is a much kinder dragon than may appear on Dragon's Den, and is um, you know adamantly encouraging that small business and creative business are what will turn the economy around in this country, and that is what we work toward. We we run as a social enterprise. We um, we provide <clears throat> subsidized places on the courses for our students because we believe so strongly that the creative sector in this country does not have the support it needs to sustain. Um, I was last week at the Berlin Music Week where I was on a panel with four women, I might add, and um, I spoke very much about how music is one of the creative sectors that touches everyone's life. And I think that's very true of design as well. I think people who aren't design junkies take for granted how everything in their home, everything on their person, everything in their life is design. There are lots of other creative sectors that we don't necessarily like. I work at Somerset House and it's London Fashion Week and I can tell you that is not a part of my life in any meaningful way. Um, but <laughs> for lots of people it is. So I think design and music are two of those sectors that touch everyone's life and for that reason I think it requires much more of our attention and our commitment to seeing it succeed, particularly in a country that claims and a city that claims to be the center for creativity in the world. Um, I think we have an obligation to invest in that if that's who we want to be. And I think it's quickly slipping away from us. I think other cities around the world are nipping at our heels to hold that title. Um, and uh, previous to this role, I was head curator at University of the Arts in London for the past six years. Um, and that is many of the art and design colleges in London. Um, and I left there a very frustrated person because I don't feel like they have a vested interest in teaching professional development to creatives. And in a world where there are very few jobs, I feel that we have an obligation to teach people how to live from what they make or do and empower them to not be intimidated, to not have fear of numbers, and to not be taught that they can't do that and you get a partner who can do that, but to take that upon themselves to change their lives. I also believe that creatives, particularly design people, have a vision and most of them don't want to work for someone else except to get those clock up those hours learn those basic skills and get on and open up your own label as well you should and i feel that that those basic skills should be taught should be embedded in the curricula in in education in this country and it isn't in fact i have a theory which is completely unfounded and uneducated but i'm going to make it publicly um, that canadians must be the perfect business people and this is why brits i have found being an american are so self-deprecating and apologetic in their wonderfulness and their creativity and their power as, as entrepreneurs and as makers. Americans are so um, capitalistic and commercially focused and often have a reputation of not having lots of soul. I disagree, but whatever. Those are the stereotypes. I think Brits have a real chip on their shoulder about um, losing that the difference between selling and selling out, which Matt and I talk a lot about, I think that there's a fear that you're, if you're selling, you're selling out. And Americans are happy to sell out and just count their money all day. If, if that's true, if those two extreme stereotypes are true, then somewhere in the middle is Canada. And I think they must have a really balanced version of those two theories because it is important to be commercially focused and to be capitalistic and to understand the value and the worth of the things you're designing, which I think we often overlook here, but it's also important to be soulful and have the integrity in the work and have that commitment to what you want to do. So let's do the research, someone call Canada, we'll see if they're good at it. But I think it's a very important thing that we need to do to empower British makers to understand that they can be incredible entrepreneurs. Um, I was quoted in the New York Times last week saying that it was very out of context but that professional development for creatives is on par with sex education for young people. And I agree with that statement, although it was taken out of context. I think that if you don't teach creative people professional development in every aspect of what they're doing, whether they want to be commercial or not, they won't have the tools they need to make that choice for themselves and they won't be able to implement that. And I think, like sex said, if you don't know about it, you're gonna get screwed. So it's important to have these kind of basic skills and that's what I do at School for Creative Startups. So there is my less classy version of design speak. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you Medea. So um, four very interesting and divergent views but a lot of overlap as well. Um, we'll talk for a little bit and then pick up some uh, questions from the audience so please start thinking. For me there was something fascinating here about um, the acceptance at some level that design you either kind of get or don't get. We were talking here about sort of education and aesthetics. Um, 
to what extent have you found in your business that actually it isn't so much getting it or not getting it, because that would in, uh, suggest that one would have to recruit the right people. Can, uh, can you persuade, especially maybe in, in the sort of the world of technology, have you found good ways to persuade that actually design does punch hard, it can make significant uh, impact, it's not just a nice to have? Clive, do you want to? Um, well, one of the things I like telling people is that we're all designers, and I think that um, not, not thinking that design is always done by someone else, but there are lots of really practical things around design thinking that you can use in your everyday life as everybody from a senior manager to a CEO. Uh, and I find that actually liberates people and they come to understand design in a much more inclusive way. And there's an awful lot of stuff like having more than one idea or prototyping stuff early before the techies have spent lots of money building something and then find out that people didn't want it. So there's lots of really useful things about design that people get quite excited about rather than saying, you must now go and spend 250,000 on a design consultant. Um, so, and I think that's much more sort of a better way to talk about design. Yeah. Minister, do you accept the, the, the assertion that maybe there's a, there's a lack of uh, understanding about uh, design or, or creativity or aesthetics? Uh, yes, I do. Absolutely. I mean, I said, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, I don't think you could, uh, you know, you, you can't mandate to businesses that they should use design. I think the best way to get a business uh, to adopt design, and I, perhaps because I was talking to a lot of local businesses in my constituency this morning, this is why I'm sort of focused on this. Uh, I think they would have to see their peer group. They would have to see similar businesses benefiting from design. But I certainly. Uh, found that I had to persuade my colleagues in Parliament about the importance of design. We all know uh, it's the deep cliche. I think graphic design suffers from this in, in particular. You know, branding. Uh, well, you know, I could just do the brand on the back of a piece of paper. It doesn't matter. Uh, and I think what uh, was said earlier about great design being all around us and people not appreciating it. I mean, I, I find it very ironic that people can kind of cavil at the suggestion that you might spend 25,000 or 50,000 pounds on a, on a branding exercise to brand something, yet you, know, you get on the tube and you're looking at a graphic design that's been around for 70 or 80 years, that's iconic. If you stop Londoners in the street and ask them to identify the kind of things that represent London, the London taxi, the route master, which became you know, a political issue, a political policy in the, in the mayoral election before last, uh, those are kind of things that uh, you know really matter to people, and yet at the same time, you still get. And I find it obviously in my brief with culture as well. Too many people thinking, well, it's just an add-on. It's a nice to have. It's a bit of a luxury. I don't think they understand how fundamentally important it is, and and how crucial it can be to the success of many businesses. And Apple is, of course, Apple is the great cliche. I mean, it is a, a design-led business that has become the biggest company in the world. And as you said earlier, you know, QED. And so in terms of this, this uh, needing for understanding, but also a sense of peer education, which I would assume is both in terms of the sector that you're in, as well as maybe geographically, who is close to you. I mean, Nick, could you talk a little bit more about, let's say, yeah, the influence of Apple or not? I mean, to what extent you, being in a technology uh, centre, but being in Oxford, not Cupertino, to what extent do you find that the mere mention of the word Apple in your business knocks everyone over? Or in fact, do you have to work a bit, a bit harder than that? And I think um, Clive was making a valid point, which is the uh, everybody inside the business is, was already doing design. You know, they just didn't necessarily label it as uh, as exactly that. My point about education for aesthetics was a was specific point about um, making sure there's a common language by which people can exchange the uh, the information. In terms of whether um, design is necessarily now at the heart of every technology business, I think. Um, you know, the commercial success uh, of Apple is, isn't the only example. And there are plenty of examples uh, of well-designed businesses, even ones without even, you know, radius, radii or, or shape or physical products, right? Great service design um, within the technology sector that can illustrate premium profits can be accrued where you do design the thing right uh, first time. Because a well-designed you know, product or service, um, it, it may, you may be able to charge no more extra for it, but it may cost you half the price to make it. So uh, inside our business, I don't think I ever go to any meetings and say, well, you know, we've got to spend the extra 25K on the design. It's a, it's a, it's a foregone conclusion that the thing costs that, that but it will you know, deliver great benefits further downstream. So. Thank you. Thank you.
So, Medea, I'm sort of fascinated by, on the one hand, we've got discussion about businesses that are a lot about growth, and the question is how to make sure that design is a part of it. Over your end of the world, design is, of course, baked into what you're doing. You've mentioned already some of the challenges, I suppose, of persuading creative people at times that they should be going for economic growth. Do you and Doug have any particular economic targets of uh, how much economic impact you expect to make with the School for Creative Startups? Well, Doug would love to see his face on the cover of Time magazine uh, being the man who moved the needle on the GDP. Um, I don't have such glamorous um, expectations. My, my measure of success is so different for each person because their, their ideal and what they want to achieve is so different. I would like to see businesses feeling like th they can navigate the terrain and that they're not getting screwed, that when they look at their numbers, they understand where the money's coming from, what the costs are, you know, and I very much agree with your point about working with manufacturing. I mean, the biggest hurdle, you know, we work with businesses, we get them up and running. They, I had a girl who pitched to Mary Portis and is now in every house of Fraser, Mary Portis or across the country. I'd like to point out that when I met her, she couldn't string a sentence together, but it's not all me. She did a great job. And it, but her greatest hurdle was she got a huge order and she couldn't fulfill it. She, she couldn't actually, she didn't have the capital to do that. And, you know, for me, that's, why would you not give a great loan to that person? They've got an order, the money is sitting there, but she has to get this manufactured and her costs are great and finding people to deal with to actually make her product. And those hurdles are huge. So helping someone through that, because the very tricky thing with design is while it may start with you, it, it, becomes dependent on someone else to realize that and, and to have it manufactured, to have it pick, pack and ship, to have it wrapped and sent and sold. There are lots of elements. It's not just you sitting in a room drawing designs. And I think we we miss that part. That part is glazed over when you watch those shows like Brit, Brit, Britain's Greatest Designer, whatever, you know, they, someone takes your thing away and you get back a, um, a model and then <laughs> it's being sold in John Lewis. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's not the fact, you know. So I guess my economic impact in numbers is that's very gray, that's different for everyone. What I would like to see is people being able to manage that whole journey from the, the idea through to the realization to sending to, you know, selling an Ikea or wherever you want to be selling or having your own store, being Mr. Heatherwick, whatever the journey is for that person, but getting to have transactions, to have money coming in, to self-sustain, really. I think that's the goal. Anything above that is glamorous, but being able to live from what you do is freeing. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, we've got about five minutes left, so I think it's very much over to you, the audience, for uh, questions you've got. So creativity and the sort of the fundamental model that we're, we're pursuing here. So we've got Olympic legacy, something about sort of financing and supporting growth, and something about creativity um, to reinvent the model that we are uh, bringing our creativity towards rather than merely making more of the same. Any particular favorites? From um. Uh, we're about to launch a road show talking about SEIS, which Ed will correct me on, but I think it's seed invest, uh, on, I don't know, seed enterprise investment scheme that the government's doing. Um, and it makes it very, um, it makes it very investor friendly to work with small startups. And it also, um, it makes invest, it, companies needing investment much more likely to get it. Um, Doug is doing a like 10 day tour around the country explaining it because it's a very complicated scheme initially, but actually when you uncover the bits of it, it, it is a much, um, a much more attractive kind of investment scheme. I, I think the thing about startups at the moment is it's a wonderful climate for starting up and there is a ton of money and I'm so sick of hearing people say there isn't money. There's tons of money, but most people starting up wouldn't know what to do with it if they got it. And it's really, really important that we teach businesses and businesses understand so they don't have that really awesome moment when they start sweating and the dragon's done because they don't know their numbers what, what why they need the investment and when they're investment ready and and not to look around for investment before you need it because you end up giving a lot of your company away and giving it away and giving it away and needing more investment and never really getting to a place where you're we're right for it you look at someone like um um who's the famous milliner philip tracy you know he's given away most of his company because he's a brilliant designer but he's a horrible businessman wherever you are, Philip. But he's, he's continually taken investment, doesn't own his name anymore. You know, he's, he's really taken it at the wrong moments and there's a right time to take it. And I think there are a lot of government support programs. The Arts Council now is giving low interest loans to businesses. There are a lot of ways to get capital to start up, but I think it's really about beg borrowing and stealing and kind of not stealing, but you know, 
but it's tapping kind of ultra lean. It's sort of a, a lean startup model, yeah. leaner than ever yeah, before. Maybe. Absolutely, and pulling yeah. on your communities. I think community is a massive crowdfunding. There's all kinds of ways to get funding today, and design has a big role in all of that. Great. I think Clive wants to come in. But I was going to do the first and third question. You did the second one. Um, I think the Olympic legacy is we might all become a little bit Canadian because um, we might be more confident now. We actually delivered something amazing and stop being so worried about it and just get on doing amazingly innovative experiences. And the third question is, yes, I do think design has something to do with the closed loop manufacturing and things like that, but engineers have a lot more to do with it and we should study th thermodynamics less and closed loop manufacturing more. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, any other final thoughts? Otherwise, I think I'll wrap it up and say thank you very much indeed to our panel, Ed Vasey, Nick Bolton, Clive Grinier, Amadeo Cohen-Petrolino, and thank you very much for coming.